All right, uh, today we want to go ahead and talk a little bit about a movement that uh, is talked about sometimes as the Second Great Awakening. It was a, an effort to restore um, some of the religious fervor uh, that had been present in earlier times in colonial history and in American history, um, and, and also a chance to reform some of our social institutions. Uh, both these efforts, the effort to restore religious interest or an interest in religion and to reform our society were both part and parcel part of what was known as the Second Great Awakening. Uh, the Second Great Awakening, the, the, the restoration piece begins with a couple different strains. One is called Unitarianism. Uh, Unitarianism was really popular more in New England. It really appeals to the wealthy and there's a big emphasis in reason over emotion that, that faith can be arrived at reasonably. If you just have preachers who can go through the text and rationally analyze it, that you can convince people to follow Christianity. Kind of juxtaposed to the Unitarian movement then uh, is a movement known as revivalism. Revivalism, like I said, is really just the opposite of that. It's a big emphasis on emotional conversions. And, and this is really popular in the South and especially in the West, in Appalachia and, uh, and what today you would call the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Illinois. And they would have what were called revival meetings where uh, groups of people would come together. Oftentimes, um, it was a, just as much a social event as a religious event where people who lived really pretty isolated lives out on the frontier had a chance to come together with lots of other people. And so the revival meetings were really hugely popular and drew lots of people from all over the countryside. And, and this movement really appeals more to the poor. Uh, some of the more prominent pe preachers uh, revival preachers, Charles Finney, Peter Cartwright, these are some of the most popular preachers of the day, most popular speakers of the day, uh, and they were part of the revival movement. Uh, also, there was a, a movement within African American churches. Uh, in particular, uh, a lot of them, again, located in the Northeast, Bethel African Church uh, in Philadelphia, one of the most prominent. Uh, the preacher there, uh, Richard Allen, uh, was a Methodist, and he goes ahead and he advocates for uh, political change and cultural change uh, in the United States. And this really becomes a centerpiece of African American culture uh, and becomes a big part of the abolition movement. Uh, the churches in the African American community were incredibly powerful, really all the way up through civil rights. Uh, and in fact, you still see uh, the African American churches uh, in many cases help to organize the African American society uh, even to this day. Uh, ministers can have a powerful impact. And that all traces back to the Second Great Awakening. Uh, also, uh, there were efforts that were not necessarily religious uh, to restore uh, and to reform America. One of the big movements that really has an impact uh, on our country and really our world is transcendentalism. Uh, the guy who comes up with the idea of transcendentalism, the philosophy, is a guy by the name of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson goes ahead and says that, look, there are transcendent truths that you can develop from nature uh, and that... Um, you can go ahead, like uh, some of the truths, like simplicity, stuff like that. These were some of his thoughts. And while he's the guy who really comes up with uh, transcendentalism, uh, the guy who really is probably most noted and has the longest lasting impact is one of his disciples, Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau writes Civil Disobedience, and he writes a book on Walden Pond. Walden Pond was really a book that tried to emphasize how do you live the simple life? How do you live a life that uh, is free of complexities? Uh, where the civil disobedience is more of an essay against slavery. Walden Pond is a book, and it's really one that has a lasting impact till this day. And again, as I've already stated, the, the emphasis in transcendentalism was an emphasis on simplicity, an emphasis on, an emphasis on nature, uh, and this transcendent truths that can be developed and, and observed in nature. They really don't like organized religion. These guys were not religious, really. Uh, they, they definitely relied more on human reason than they did on, on traditional religion. Some of the reform movements that came out of this, public schools, um, for the first time, began being supported by taxpayers. Um, uh, direct taxes where uh, property tax, things like that, things that we are familiar with today, that trace their roots right back to the Second Great Awakening. Uh, one of the first states to implement this policy was Massachusetts. They, they appointed a guy, Horace Mann, who becomes the Secretary of Education of Massachusetts. He's the very first... Uh, Secretary of Education and Horace Mann believed that education it was necessary to be a good citizen uh, in a democracy. And that's really one of the, the underlying principles still in our education system today. And it traces its roots right back to the Second Great Awakening. Uh, prisons also, um, uh, folks like Dorothea Dix, 
uh, who advocated for an emphasis on rehabilitation rather than punishment, uh, who advocated for mental health hospitals that, you know, a lot of people in our prisons w weren't necessarily criminals, but they were incompetent. Uh, and, and so those folks needed something different than a prison. And that's a movement that you see kind of picking up steam a little bit today. We kind of went away from that. Uh, and now we're kind of moving back towards it. Uh, other critics of the, the prison system, guys like Alexis de Tocqueville, who writes Democracy in America, uh, really one of the foundational works describing American society. And he's around back in the, the mid-1800s, going around and touring America and writing about what he sees. Uh, he was a Frenchman who came over here. Uh, and again, a huge scholarly work, Democracy in America, till this day. Uh, there were folks who also advocated for utopian societies, or in other words, perfect societies. Uh, and these were guys who really wanted to try to make things, to get rid of all human frailty, to get rid of uh, corruption and things like that. Noble goals, um, but really uh, sometimes goals that are proving a little bit more elusive and sometimes even maybe a little bit dangerous. But some of the guys like George Ripley establishes what's called Brook Farm just outside of Boston. They really practice what amounts to communism, where all members shared ownership of everything. The utopian society was a complete failure. Brook Farm failed. And in fact, most utopian societies were, in fact, uh, proved to be uh, completely unworkable. So uh, that's a little bit about the Second Great Awakening.